Before I want to start, I just want to show you graph my views and subs over the last 365 days. In the last two months, my view count has doubled, and that's pretty insane. Thanks for at the time of recording this, 81 subs. By the way, in case you're interested, you can check out Milk the Cow in the description down below. This is the pause menu I created by myself for my video game Milk the Cow. This right here took me approximately two months to create. If you're someone who doesn't do game dev, you'll probably say something like, Oh, cool, but why are you showing me this? I'm showing you this for one main reason. This was a pain in the ass to make. There are no really straight tutorials on how to make something like this, and so I had to think, okay, what feature do I want? And navigate Stack Overflow and Unity Forms for every single thing I did to get exactly what I wanted. The hardest part, however, by far, was creating a cool UI setup that I like. That's why I'm here making this video, so beginner game devs can have an easy way to make something like this. The thing is, this video has gone through a lot of script changes because of one major issue. I don't want to tell you just how to make this. I want to tell you how to make a pause menu that fits your game's style. And that's a lot more nuanced and subjective than you might think. After some thought, here's what I figure is the best way about going and making a pause menu stylized for your game. If you want an easy way to prototype what your pause menu will look like, the first thing you want to do is learn a photo editing program. I recommend GIMP because it's free and I'm going to use it in this tutorial. If you've never used GIMP, I recommend spending about seven hours learning so you can get a good understanding of the basics. But if you know another photo editing program, just use that one because no matter the program you're using, you should be able to replicate what I'm going to do in it. J just if you're using Paint, no, just, just learn something else, please. What you want to do now is create a project that's 1920 by 1080 in resolution. Next step we're going to do is draw out what we're going to want our pause menu to look like. This step is easier if you already have an idea of what you want your pause menu to look like. If you don't, like I did when I was creating this, I recommend taking a game's pause menu that you like, find an image of it online and download it, or take a screenshot yourself, and then drag it into your GIMP project. Later we will adjust the color and placement of buttons and images to fit what your game needs. This step is just so we can get a general sense of what we want our pause menu to look like. I like Tonka Impact's pause menu a lot, so when I was making my pause menu, I mimicked theirs and then changed up what I needed when needed. There's no reason to fix something that isn't broken, but to straight up literally copy down to the pixel their pause menu and then a change a few words to make it mine would have also been like, N no. So once you have an image of the pause menu up, you're going to want to analyze it and constantly say what makes this in this pause menu good. If you already have an idea of what you want your pause menu to look like, just watch through this and keep what I say here in mind when you create the assets for it. So, for example, the back button up here is pretty handy, and the color scheme works very well. The top part that shows you what level you're in is nice with the gray font and italics, and the little black bar with the triangles is pretty cool. Why did they choose that specific pattern with the triangles and the blue color scheme? Well, the Hawkeye Impact Pause Menu is a pause menu designed for a sci-fi oriented game, Hawkeye Impact 3rd. This sort of combination of shapes and color scheme give off a very sci-fi feel. So what's a pattern that can be associated with cows? The answer that I found was pretty obvious. The cowhide pattern. When I was creating the 3D model for the others in Blender, I also did a 3D model for cow with a cow skin shader as well. What I did to create this pattern on my top bar of my pause menu was take a plane, apply that shader to the plane, then a bunch of shader related crap, skip to this timestamp, or use YouTube chapters if you don't care. Then I render it out at the pixel length that I needed, making sure it's at 200% to look nice. And that's how I got a stylized asset specific to milk the cow. I also animated it, and you can see how I did that in front of you. If you want to see it better, put the video at 0.25x speed. Now, back in GIMP with your pause menu project, make sure that every time you create an asset, it's in a new layer by clicking this add layer button in the bottom right corner here. In terms of layout, the tabs being on the side here is pretty convenient. And since I plan on having a small amount of tabs like this and on a large amount, like for example, Doom Eternal, this works just fine. 
This part that fades out towards the top and bottom here looks nice, nice and gives the people who look at this something to look at. This triangle and slightly faded triangle which points to the panel that has a black background will clear up any confusion and give people who play the game an obvious idea of where to look. The continue button and exit button look very clean. However, taking a closer look, looking at the color scheme of these two buttons and the color scheme of the new bar asset, a vibrant green and dark red would look much better than this yellow and red. When I took a closer look at this dark blue background color, I didn't like it with the color scheme either. However, after experimenting with some colors, nothing else seemed to fit. I then realized that the grid pattern also put me off, as it too was too sci-fi. I then decided, why not try to do a lighter blue with a cow pattern? So I grabbed a free cow pattern image off of Google, and using these color race and combine options for the layers, I quickly realized that slightly tinting the black, but entirely replacing the whites with this after a lot of experimentation, medium brightness blue to purple turquoise gradient would look swell. Do something like that for a background of your pause menu. Speaking of tabs, this is also a great time to figure out what the names of your tabs in your game will be and what they will do. After some time, I came to the conclusion that an audio tab, graphics tab, and settings tab for in-game things and then a separate tab to show what settings are applied right now would be the best decision. Like how Honkai Impact did it, I put the audio and graphics tab at the bottom and the game-specific ones at the top. And what we're basically doing is recreating this pause menu in our own style. Now, in every pause menu, there's a section of the pause menu that changes depending on what tabs you click to and there's sections that don't so for example right when you click the graphic settings over here the graphic settings would appear but the buttons over here would stay the same only the buttons over here would disappear and other buttons would appear in their place and a different ui layout would appear in its place so in honkai Effect here how they've done that is they signified that area that changes with this light blue rectangle here now we're going to do something similar, so just outline the rectangle, and then once you've done that, make it whatever color you like. I'm going to make mine darker, and now what I could do is I can fill it in the max opacity set if I like it with less opacity later, I'll turn it down to less opacity. What I can do is in the layers, I can just change the opacity here, and I think that looks pretty good. Now, when you click these tabs, what's going to happen is the contents inside this black square here will change. The reason we do this is because once somebody clicks, for example, the audio settings, we don't want all the buttons to change all of a sudden unless they're specific to the audio tab. So, for the standard layout, what did Honkai Impact do? Well, one of their tabs is a map, with the fact that it's a map in the top left and a slightly less gray style of the level name. Editing 4680R here, and this is something I realized I didn't explain well enough. What a map is, is something I like to call a game-specific tab. What that means is that every game will need it. For example, Milk the Cow. Milk the Cow doesn't need a map tab. However, some of you will want to have a map tab, and some of you will want to have other game-specific tabs. Now, I can't dream up of every single type of game-specific tab in existence, because even the same type of tab, a map tab, let's compare Genshin and Honkai, the same developers. I can't imagine that the process for creating the Honkai map and the Genshin map, both separate game-specific tabs, was anything remotely similar. How this menu looks is going to have to come from your head. And what your game specific tab, if you're creating one, is going to do is going to have to be thought of by you. Now, if you're going, well, how do I do that? Just think about the use the pause tab's going to have. And then lay it out, lay out the buttons, sliders, toggles, whatever you need, in a way that makes sense. Keep in mind that when you're making a pause menu tab, that it should fit the general style of your pause menu. However, it should look different enough that at a glance, somebody can tell, oh, this is the audio settings. Oh, this is graphic settings. Oh, this is next game settings, as an example in my case. However, I did create two game-specific tabs, and that were the next game settings tab and the current game settings tab for Milk the Cow. If you want to know, this is the process of how I did it. So, because I think it looks good, I'll put the name, the top left, in slight gray and italics, put a bar around it to signify that it's separate the rest of the contents inside this black square, and since this is an area which I don't want to be changeable, I'll organize this like a list. And since most of these settings are only on or off, we'll make it so that it's the name of the setting and a checkbox that's either checked or unchecked. And put two test settings here so that when we go to Unity and implement this, all we have to do is overlay it. For next game settings, which I plan to be literally the same thing, but the checkboxes are clickable, I'm going to make the checkboxes larger so they're easier to click. Now for the graphics and audio tabs. These two are universal, so I expect most of you will need to put these in, as opposed to my new game settings and current game settings tabs. So, when you're making your graphics settings tab, know there's 
mainly two different styles. There's compact menus and desktop app menus. Now, if those are just what I call them, there's probably a technical name for both of these somewhere. Compact menus are more mobile-style menus, where you have set presets and you have arrows and stuff, and you can increase the graphics quality or decrease it somewhat. That's what Honkai Impact has, and that's what I decided to do. There are also desktop app menus, which are more like Deep Rock Galactic or Doom Eternal style menus, where there's a whole bunch of different settings and there's drop downs everywhere. Mobile apps can't really afford to do that because there's not as much room on the screen and misclicks would make drop downs pretty frustrating. So decide which one you want. Like I said, I went with the compact, but make sure to give some customizability. Uh, make sure to have a custom preset. Uh, out of all the presets you have, I got five presets for mine because honka impact did five and i decided that looked pretty good low ultra super ultra just affects some really lighting and shadow quality and then there's custom which you can change i decided to go for a vertical layout with this tab over here showing what changes between each of the presets now you're also going to want to make this fit your color scheme of your game that much you're going to have to stay consistent with. This really is all there is to make any graphics tab. So now, on to the audio menu. I recommend you use sliders for everything. Having, you know, like four presets for audio, that's th something that I think I've seen somewhere, and it was like, why? You could just use a slider to do this, guys. One mistake that I see a lot of games make, which I think needs to be set is master volume. There should be a master control volume in your game, especially if you're using something like Unity, where it's built in. And then you need to decide from there how many more sliders you're going to have. So in Deep Rock Galactic, they have, you know, dialogue, music, etc. Milk the Cow, the only sounds right now are music, so I divided it into two different categories. Out of game music and the level that you're currently playing's volume. The level that you're currently playing's volume is unique to every level. I save it with playerplus.setstring, the name of your level, with some sort of consistent naming system. Hey hey, editing 4680R here. I realize I didn't explain this too well, so let me... I'm too lazy to get Visual Studio. Let's just use Notepad. Let's say you had something like I did, where you're saving the pause menu settings and you're saving something that's level specific. So what you would want to do is you would want to create a unique key for each player prep because you wouldn't want data from like other levels. So in this case, it's the level for, it's the volume for each level for me. You wouldn't want the volume from like one level that it's entirely separate, uh, overriding the volume for a separate level. So what you would do is you'd say player prefs dot set that in, and then you do, you do the key. So it'd be like player, settings and then you would type out the next part and for everything that had to do with player settings let's say i wanted to i also wanted to save the level name for some reason i was creating a level creator and i wanted to save the level's name in the player prefs i, I would also use player settings in that situation or for example let's say i was saving a toggle i would say player settings and then toggle one right so in this situation what i would do is something like Player settings scene manager dot get active scene dot name and as long as each individual level had a unique name, no player prep would ever be overwritten. And then of course the volume. So I'll do just like audio listener dot volume. But the main thing I want you to pay attention to here is how for everything that had to do with player settings, I would put this player settings tag in front. And you want to do this because you don't want things from other places overriding, say, player prefs. So it's an organizational thing to make sure you don't make your players lose any data by accident. So basically, now that we've done each of our tabs, we now need to do the things that stay consistent no matter which tab you're on. So what I mean by that, I mean things like the continue button and the exit button and the back button, the transparent thing I was talking about that stay there no matter which tab you click to. Now each pause menu will be different, so instead of going every asset and detail that I'm going to make, because that would make no sense, here's a time lapse on Forex speed to show you an example of what you should do. Now if you're trying to make your own unique pause menu, I already explained how to make these details, but basically again what you want to do is you want to look at pause menus from other games and say, would this fit in my pause menu? And once you have enough details, once you feel like your pause menu is not crowded, but like full, right? It's like a good meal. And once you feel like you've reached that point, stop adding assets if you don't need to. Here's the time lapse. Skip to this time stamp if you don't care, or use YouTube chapters.
And then out of game volume basically just means the volume for the beginning menu and the menu where you're changing levels. Now it's time for the implementation and coding of your pause menu. You're going to want each individual detail in your pause menu to be its own asset, mainly if you want to make slight tweaks because you find out what you did in GIMP looks bad. Alright, if you want a quick guide on how to export every asset, this is basically how you do it. So I'm going to use this transparent bar as an example. So you go to the layer that it's in, you right clicked, you right click, make sure you select all, then edit, then copy. Now control N to create a new layer, and then right click, edit, paste as new layer, and then delete your background layer, and then right click image crop to content, and then control shift E to export it. Now, let's say you're going along doing this, and, and you know, I'm saying right click, copy, you know, paste as, that, and then I realized, whoops, there's accidentally two assets in one. What you can do is you can go to your select tool, select the first asset, clear it, and then right click image content, control shift E, right, and then control Z until the part that you erased is back. And now select the other part, clear it, crop to content, control shift E, uh, arrow there you go you've exported both those assets back to what i was talking about each asset should not have any transparent space around it unless the transparent space is intentional and the reason is because when you import things into unity you're just going to be able to drag and drop it onto whatever object you need the asset to be on and you can just click set negative size and then bam it spaces it correctly but if you add a bunch of extra transparent space around it, it's just going to look weird and then when you click something for example that the target is actually based on the assets box and so like if you have like 200 extra pixels below the thing without you meaning to what's gonna end up happening is you're gonna try to click something else it's gonna end up clicking the button that has 200 extra pixels below it you could fix that by using something called dot alpha test minimum threshold but that requires script and code resources it's easier just to export it correctly you're also going to want to export the entire pause menu so you have a reference point to align everything in unity i want to talk about the difference between the text component and the text mesh pro text component the first thing i want to talk about is what tm pro actually like is and what it does so what you notice here is you got the text and it's got the text component the only actual difference between this and an empty object besides the canvas render is the fact that it has this text component and everything is really stored in that text component that's really all a text object is it's just a regular game object with a text component so you can you know change the text you can see it changing right over here and then you know i can switch it from Arial to the default fonts although these are actually part of the text mesh pro fonts a few of these here I think, yeah, everything besides Arial is actually part of the TextMaster Pro font. If you set it to none, what ends up happening is it ends up doing the outlines of the things. And then you can change the font. The font size is an integer. You get the font style. You can change the line spacing, which would be... And then there's this overflow, which I want to talk about right now because I need to use it with line spacing. Horizontal overflow is what happens if the text reaches the boundary on the right and on the left and vertical overflow is what happens when the text reaches the boundary on the top and on the bottom so if i put it this see how it wraps around if i change it from wrap to overflow it'll just keep going uh, however if i change this from overflow to tourniquet you see it deletes everything that touches this bottom boundary here you got the alignment it works like google docs you got the center right left middle bo middle bottom top I think the most important button, however, is Raycast Target because it decides whether or not you can actually click. The, when you click the UI element, it registers and doesn't click on anything behind it. So let's say these text, for example, let's say you had a text that was over a button. You wouldn't want that text to affect how you can click the button. So you would turn that Raycast Target off. And images also have this option too. But of course, sometimes you want Raycast Target. Like, for example, with my game, if there was no Raycast Target, on the background you could pause the game and then click the udders and you could abuse the pause system to gain score so keep that in mind next thing i want to talk about is the fact that you can make custom fonts it needs to be in either dot true type format or open type fonts for the text component this is not applicable for text mesh pro and i'll show you why in a second but first if you do have a font in a different project that you want to import to a new one like I do, you 
can go, you can click on the font asset, you can click export package, then export, and then save it in where, wherever the folder is. Now you can import it by going right click, import package, custom package, you got the import. Now look at the font here, keep looking at the font, bam it changes, that's because my font changed. Now you, bold fonts do exist, so this font particularly is at bold by default, so if I add bold, it doesn't actually do anything. That's just something to know, but as you can see, it is a good component, it works, but Text Mesh Pro, as you're about to see, is a lot better. So, what Text Mesh Pro is, is you go to Project Settings, it actually has its own tab, Import TMP and Essentials, and Import TMP Examples and Extras. I recommend you do both of those, because it well, using the TMP examples and extras, you get a general idea of how it works, and it is, it just helps, right? So, if I go UI Text Mesh Pro, you'll notice that the default is Liberation Sans, or whatever, yeah, at least for me it is. Uh, for, if for you, I'm not sure, but if you don't import the essentials, this is why I recommend importing the essentials, I don't think it actually has a font by default, not sure, anyways. The point is, if you want to import your own font, it's a pretty complicated process. I recommend you check out this video from CodeMonkey. It has no unnecessary details, and I'll let you pause the video right here, and once you come back, you'll be ready to seamlessly follow whatever you want to follow from this tutorial if you want a custom font. CodeMonkey is always a great YouTuber, and he doesn't leave any extra unnecessary stuff in his videos. Once you're done with the video, you should have something like this in your assets. I know that uh, for me, it took a few tries to actually get a TMP asset that wasn't blurry and that I liked. And what you can do, if you have that specific font asset that you're going to be using all the time, you can go Edit, Project Settings, Text Mesh Pro, Settings, then in the default app, font asset, click this, and then just search for the font asset you're looking for. Once it's changed, do you know they also have all this stuff that you can change as well, but that's enough for me. You can also just drag and drop in here. If you notice, you can't actually drag and drop regular font assets, it has to be the TMP font assets. Besides what I just mentioned, the first thing you'll notice is that there's a lot more options here. So, besides, you know, the options in the component, you also got all these options down here, which uh, there's so many options I can't go over all of them right now. I'll just tell you the main ones. You've got the RTL editor, which basically just reverses the text. You've got text styles, which are basically just these presets. The font asset, you can't drag in regular font assets like I've already mentioned. For font style, right, you've got lowercase, uppercase, small caps, all pretty cool. Font size is now a float instead of an integer. Vertex color, which is just the color. You've got more spacing options besides just the line. You've got more alignment options. And the main three besides that, oh, besides the color gradient, which is also a pretty cool option. Overflow, you'll notice there's a lot more options. This is for the vertical overflow. The two that were in the previous component that are now in here are tourniquet and overflow. Tourniquet deletes everything past the text boundary. Overflow lets it go past. Wrapping, enable, disable. That's the horizontal wrapping. It enable, disable, do the same things as they did in the previous in the regular text component. Now, in the extra settings, I'm not sure if this mentioned, if I mentioned this already, Raycast target, it does the same thing as it does in the regular text component. And besides that, that's basically all the main uses of the Text Mesh Pro component that I know of or that, and that we're going to be using here. Now it's time for the coding and implementation of what you just made in GIMP. So if you haven't done so already, go to Unity and open your project up. After you've done that, import all your assets. By right-clicking the folder that you want to import them in, clicking this Import New Asset button, and then importing whatever you want. Put that out of the way. In your game, if you don't have a canvas yet, what you want to do is UI and say, we'll just do Image. Now what you want to do under this canvas is, or probably under this image actually, probably want Pause Menu, menu something like that. So in the source image now, drag and drop in the exportation of your of the entire pause menu so that would be this in my case bam and then what you want to do is since it'll probably be a square click this button called set native size and if your screen is 19 by 20 by 1080 it will perfectly fit across the screen 
Now what you want to do is probably turn down the opacity of this because what you're going to do now is under this you're going to put all the UI elements of your canvas. So we'll do UI and then we'll do image and this will be the background. So by the way, what you might want to do is test before you decide fully on a background. If you don't like the colors like I did when I first did my background, I realized it was too dark and contrasting. It didn't really look well. You might want to go back and tweak your background a little, re-import it. As you can see, I did four different importations of the background before I got one that I liked. And then now what you're going to want to do is just disable it because when you're aligning your other UI elements, you're going to want to see the overview and the main pause menu object the, the, the parent of all this stuff as you're aligning it what we're going to do at the end is we're going to just turn off the opacity of this and nobody will ever know it's there so ui you just import everything here's a time lapse hey future 468 our heroes watching the video again and they realized i didn't tell people to make their text in unity you don't want to do the text as an asset that you import text should be something that's done in your game engine reason being you if you end up doing something to uh, let's say for different aspect ratios to make the assets stretch from the screen changes sizes what will happen is the text will end up looking really weird whereas if you just used unity's default text stuff it won't do that however it will change the position like importing it would but it won't make it all stretched and weird and stuff so basically when you're exporting your assets only export the stuff without the text and add the text in in your game engine psych i have one more thing to say before i start this and that's as you're creating the pause menu do it correctly right so for example the back one i'd make a button or a button text mesh pro probably just a button because that works well enough but let's say it's some sort of drop down i'd do that or in an input field which is text where you type in that whatever the text is a toggle for things that are on and off do it correctly all right, you can just make everything an image and then add the component later, but I don't see the point in that. I'd recommend just doing everything right here. Everything that you'd want is right here in the UI presets. And also if you're confused about, well, how do I change the way the button looks, then right here they all have an image component. Just drag in whatever you want. And then without a button component, set native size, and this is the case for basically everything. By the way, it's on 4x speed, so if you want to see what I did in real time, put the video playback on 0.25x. But even with that speeding up, it's still 12 minutes of video to watch, so if you don't want to watch it, just use the timestamps in the description, or use YouTube chapters to skip ahead. Alternatively, if you don't want to watch it at 0.25x, you can watch it at 0.5x, it's only 24 minutes, etc. You have these options. And if you don't want to spend 12 minutes watching, what you can do is you can speed it up to 2x and watch it for only 6 minutes. There's nothing in the, in the time lapse that you'll miss if you skip past it. But there are people out there who would want to watch the like what I actually did, the full process, every decision I make. So I'm leaving it in there for them. On to the time lapse. Yare, yare da wa.
Börse.
グレートですよいこいつは Alright, so that was the first part of, I don't know what to call this, my series on UI design for pause menus. Anyways, I won't waste more of your time. Thanks for watching this. Leave a like, subscribe if you enjoyed it. Hope to catch you in the next video of this series, which releases in a week after this one does. Have a nice day, guys.